Okay. Well, welcome to Ignite the Cancer Conversation, our book club edition. We're going to be reading Siddhartha Mukherjee's book, The Emperor of All Maladies, Biography of Cancer. <coughs> and um, I want to make sure we're all uh, hearing okay. I think that people in the room can hear okay. <laughs> okay, and what about people online? Can you hear okay? Yes. It's okay, a little broken at times. Okay. I'll give us a thumbs up or uh, something in chat. Say yes, I can hear. Good. Uh, also, I want to remind people who are listening online that we are recording. So uh, we definitely want you to keep your microphone on, but if you prefer not to be seen on the, um, on the video, you can turn off your video for this. <coughs> but it's also nice to see you, so you don't have to turn off your video. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, I just want to introduce our facilitators for today. I'm going to be facilita facilitating. My name is Julie Husband, and I'm working too with Whitney Johnson. Uh, I teach English at UNI, and Whitney is the marketing manager at Bill Caldwell Ford. She and I are both members of the Beyond Pink team, where Whitney is our public relations specialist. You want to say hi, Whitney? Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to uh, facilitate today and to share that responsibility with the other members of Ignite the Cancer Conversation. Uh, we picked this book because we thought that it provided the widest possible context for understanding uh, the state of research in cancer uh, science and also uh, gave us a kind of view for understanding personal stories and personal experiences in cancer. Um, I picked out a quote from Mukherjee that I thought really encapsulated his objective with the book. He said, I'm trying to cure or transform the lives of patients with cancer and I thought to myself, how can we even talk about the future when we don't know the past? So uh, for him, this, this project was about really being able to uh, sharpen his notion of where the research should go and how he could help his patients. Um, so let me give you a little background on the author. Uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee is the author of The Ember of All Maladies, The Biography of Cancer, which is a winner of the 2011 Pulitzer, Pli Pulitzer Prize in general nonfiction, and he also wrote The Laws of Medicine. He's the editor of Best Science Writing 2013. Mukherjee is an assistant professor at, of medicine at Columbia University and a cancer physician and researcher. A Rhodes Scholar, he graduated from Stanford University, University of Oxford, and Harvard Medical School. He has published articles in Nature, the New England Journal of Medicine, the New York Times, and Cell. He currently lives in New York with his wife and three daughters. Um, you can visit his website, SiddharthaMukherjee.com, and you can also follow him on Twitter. Okay, great. We thought, well, first of all, if you have any technical difficulties, we have uh, Lori and Winton here uh, who are attached to their computers and they're available for your help. So uh, don't be afraid to add something into your chat feature and let them know if you need some help. Okay, we thought we'd start by uh, working in some small groups to introduce ourselves and to um, discuss these first couple small group questions. So um, we'd like to have people in groups five, four, five, and uh, people that are in the room, if you want to maybe that back table can divide up and join these two tables. And if you're online, we're going to put you into groups of about three to four, four, five. Uh, and the two questions we'd like people to discuss. I think that uh, people online will ask you to discuss what the most striking thing you noticed so far in the book was. So you introduce yourselves, uh, say what uh, drew you to the book club, and then what was the most striking thing in the book. And then people in the room, you'll answer the second question that's up on this, the board up there. And also introduce yourselves and what drew you to the book, to the book club. Okay. 
I'm afraid to turn it on. Right on. I think when the small groups start up, they automatically, they, it, this automatically turns off. That's what I'm <laughs> anyway. Okay, I'm going to you know, go to the back. Yeah. Anyone online, if you have a a red line through the microphone, you'll need to unmute it. And we're going to be sending out a PDF with uh, the questions so you guys can see them. We just sent out the PDF with the discussion questions. If you guys want to open that up, and then you'll just have to join your small groups to be able to chat with the questions. You do have to click to join your breakout session online. Can you see who? That's right. We need to send a message.
one to do the second one if we got here oh yeah, yeah great. okay so i'll i'll address the people online and then address the people in the groups oh wait we're we gonna be able to say no no oh okay Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, do we have our online people? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 Perfect. Very good. Okay. Um, well, I thought we'd have all the groups kind of report back on general observations and respond to their question. So, uh, starting with the online folks. Folks, uh, can we have a spokesperson from uh, one of the chat groups? Uh, just tell us a little bit about what's bringing people to the book group, and then the first question, most striking thing you noticed in the book. Breakout group number one. Which group is that? Do you have a We don't know what number group we were. No, we don't either. Okay, so we're trying to get to breakout group one. So that's Barb, Jeff, Mark, Mary Kay, and then E, maybe Elizabeth, and you? We had three people in our group. You have three, okay. We, we, I think she said one. Didn't you say one was Jeff, Mary Kay, and Holly? Uh, yep. Yes. LJ is. <coughs> <laughs> This can't be the hardest part of everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, Mary Kay, because I know your name. How about you? Will, you? will you tell us what your group discussed? Well, we, we talked about the different things that we had noticed um, um, in, in the first part that we were to read. Um, we talked about the, the ancient information as well as the integration then of some of the more current information. We talked about Dr. Farber and um, how he discovered um, the, 
and, and looked at um, leukemia, how he looked at a tr and creating a trial, something that probably, while it was happened back in the 40s, wouldn't be happening today because there are too many guidelines, um, both um, from an FDA level as, as well as from a human studies perspective. Great. Yeah, it's, it was interesting to, uh, you know, hear about the stumbling blocks to research, you know, the rivalries between doctors, the inability to get patients to participate if they were affiliated with one doctor over another doctor. Um, and, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, how new people were to conducting experiments in a, a you know, blind and scientific way. Uh, what did you find about uh, what drew people to the book group? We didn't talk about that. Oh, you didn't talk about that one? Okay. No, that's fine. That's okay. Okay, what about breakout group two? That was our group, I believe. And who's that? Uh, it's Kristen. Oh, hi. Hello. Nice to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we talked. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. We talked about actually the focus on on children and how it seemed, at least to me, that children really drove some of the initial uh, research because I think that they were looking at these lives that were so young that needed to be saved versus someone who might get diagnosed or die a little further down the road. That you know, oh well, they were going to die anyway, so. You know that I took it in the beginning when I read that 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 children focus was very important in that early work. It's very. I'm not supposed to be talking. No, that's fine. Go ahead, please go. I was. What we were talking about is the reason it didn't happen sooner. Perhaps is that children were not as valued for many years. They were expected to die, and now we we center a lot of our lives around children and we find them very important. Yeah, I wonder if, um, you know, there had been this effort to shield the children and just keep them comfortable, very focused on amelioration. And um, it seemed like you actually had to break through you know, loving and wanting to protect the kids in order to make some progress. I mean, there was that uh, <laughs> reference to false kindness and, you know, having to sort of be willing to uh, cause some discomfort in children in order to hopefully make them better. I mean, so I, I don't know. I, I know I felt really queasy about some of the experiments on the children that were so very painful. Mm. Uh, would prolong life, you know, uh, but not necessarily cure the cancer. And we didn't get to the second question either. We focused on that first piece. Okay, great. Okay. Good. Is, is it, was there a, is there two or three? Just two. Just two. Okay. Uh, were we going to go for them? Yes. Okay. Do you guys want to start with your, maybe what draw you or what you guys talked about in your group? Just make sure you talk loud so they can hear. Um, in what drew us, uh, most of us, to the, was several people in our group had had, had cancer themselves and a family member, and that drew them uh, into wanting to learn more about this. Um, and uh, that was the main reason. Uh, we talked about um, how it, in the New York Times, they refused to use the word cancer or breast, and how that has changed in time. You know, that's obviously not the case any longer. You know, everybody's free to use those. So, and then we talked about the difference between discussing it as a political issue versus, um, you know, talking with your family. And I think uh, one thing that one of our members talked about was you know, telling her mother that she had cancer and the horror on her face, and and you know, and that's. I think most of us don't want to hear talk about cancer with a family member. It, we, we're going to jump to conclusions. Whereas if we're talking more in a scientific medical aspect, it's easier to listen to statistics and numbers and uh, what research is, where it's really at, what the true facts are. Um, and I think that kind of sums up. Anything else we should mention? Real positive. 
<laughs> and this table over here. Oh, um, yeah, we. I think most of us either have had cancer or a close family member, and so that's obvious <coughs> about the attraction to the subject. Uh, we talked about the breast cancer issue, that breast cancer is the sexy can cancer. It's the one that people are comfortable with. I laughed when my son as a teenager came home with a t-shirt that said, save the tatas. And I knew why he was wearing it, but it made it more mainstream. It made it easier. But I think it, in my opinion, it overshadows some of the other cancers that I think don't get as much funding, don't get as much attention, maybe don't get as much research. And breast cancer is the one NFL adopted and everybody you can think of, but nobody says <coughs> save the colon. <laughs> so um, trying to talk about breast cancer with the other cancers and making it more equal. And we also talked about the, the stigma, uh, but right now maybe the stigma is more about your survivor and your cure <coughs> or in remission, whatever the current terms are, versus metastasized. And how that's a scary word. And we all react a little different when that gets put on the table. I know for me, having cancer, and I'm still having to get checkups, that's probably the scariest word in my world right now is, is whether or not that's happening. So along with, you know, it's okay to talk about cancer, there's still other parts of cancer that are still really scary. I don't know if you guys want to add comments about that. Good. Do you have moments where um, the, the conversation moves from the abstract one about scientific advances to the personal that are uncomfortable? I mean, is that a, a moment that is very difficult to find? I think using personal examples helps illustrate your, your facts. So, you know, if you can give all the statistics in the world, especially like if you're talking to a legislator, but if you have a human face to put to it, if you have somebody they can identify then with, um, then, then they're more likely to jump on the bandwagon, which I think they talk about in this book, the Jimmy, right. um, you know, and once, once they took any ethnicity out of his name and made him, you know, an American Jimmy, then they could, you know, mainstream it all through <laughs> America and, and make tons of money. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so we had a couple other questions. Do you want to go first? first? Uh, sure. Do we, are we going to just let anybody talk? Or sure. Just, okay. So feel free to jump in whenever you want. But the, the first question is, um, Oh, and we're going to unmute everybody, by the way, as well. So feel free to jump in, but we're going to unmute all of you. So um, first question, uh, cancer is often described as a modern disease, yet its first description dates back to 2500 BC. In what sense then is cancer a disease of modern times? And how does knowing its ancient history affect your notion of cancer? So maybe we'll start online if somebody wants to speak up. Any thoughts? I'll repeat it too. Um, cancer is often described as a modern disease, yet its first description dates back from 2500 BC. In what sense then is cancer disease of modern times? How does knowing its ancient history affect your notion of cancer? This is Jeff Crandall. Um, <clears throat> I think the author does a very nice job explaining why we are more focused and have a better understanding of cancer today than we did 2,500 years ago. We understand the anatomy. Uh, we have all kinds of technology to help us uh, uh, to support the diagnoses. We live longer, so we are at older ages more prone to uh, develop cancer. Uh, in, uh, historically, 
cancer was often thought to be something else. Um, it's pretty amazing uh, to read the histories. For example, the South American woman about age 30 who had an osteosarcoma uh, in her arm. So it's not a new disease. I think we are more likely to experience it at older ages. And therefore, because we live longer, we see more of it than they did then, but they certainly had uh, uh, cancer uh, <clears throat> well-documented that many years ago. Any other thoughts online? Well, this is just a simple thought, but it sort of means there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I've read ahead a little bit, but there was the story about the chimney sweeps um, who were particularly prone to testicular or scrotal uh, cancer. And I have to say, I've always thought of cancer as a particularly like industrial era disease. I don't know if other people have thought of it as, uh, and, and that's why I'm so interested in preventative measures because I associate it with pollution and with um, uh, things in the air and water. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess I do find it surprising that it is such an ancient disease. I, I guess that does, that did surprise me. Well, in our group, we did talk about that a little bit, and we noted that there were still a lot of, you know, contaminants and toxins that people could come in contact with. I mean, even in ancient times, like metals used as pigments. And for example, we talked about lead for, you know, one. Right. Uh-huh. Anyone in the room want to comment? Any thoughts about modern disease? Well, this is kind of related, but like with what you were talking about with like lead and uranium, that was one of the things that really like, I don't know, I feel like those parts were almost hard to read because like with our present day knowledge, some of the practices that they used to employ in just everyday life that are so toxic. <laughs> the ladies that lick the brushes. Yeah. I just was like, what? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, one of the things that's distinctive about the book is that Mukherjee intersperses Carla's story in with the history of cancer. And I wondered what you thought of that technique of his. How did that uh, impact your reception of the book? I think that's probably the only way he could write the book and keep a lay person reading it. <laughs> I mean, seriously, because I'm not a scientific person and um, but I like heavy books, but all the dates and a lot of the medical terminology probably would have made me read it a lot slower, but I was reading to get to anecdotal stories that then I could then apply to the science that they were giving. And so I think by interspersing um, her, her story, I think you find very few readers who could not, know, did not know a person like Carla. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Does, does everybody have a microphone at their table? No. Are you having a hard time hearing? It's sometimes hard. Yeah, it is sometimes hard to hear. And um, not the two people that have got, that it look like they've got the microphone right there. Sure. But as we get further out, as we get further out into the room. We get, um, and we can pass it around for, no, I'll just move this here. Or, oh, that might help. And then if people kind of direct their head when they're talking toward the microphone, that will make a difference as well, based on previous experience I've had. And speak loud. Right. Yeah, good. Thank you for telling us that. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the question was about interspersing Carla's story. And you were saying that that's kind of what led you on, you know, that it was- Oh, for sure, yes. It was identification. And I think one of the, um, what it mirrors is what the surgeons and the doctors are also going through. Yes. It's about the science, but it's also about the people. So they cannot help but be impacted by that. And I think that comes through in the book. He, he's moved by those experiences and yet he knows the science behind it. And he's trying to find a balance himself in, in processing it. And still have that personal side yes. of being a doctor that's caring. 
I thought that came up too, that he's still trying to be a doctor that cares, mm -hmm. but with everything that he knows to go in and say the right words. And, mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting how he said when he first talked about that the call or the message to visit this patient is how he went to his mind what he was going to his mind to do. And so it was like, it was like he said it was kind of almost kind of almost a you know, something he said before. When you want to post it, maybe we should walk to the mic instead. Maybe we should walk to the mic, okay. Uh, I think it's, it's not very often that you hear a doctor, you know, say that, you know, he's, you know, he's consumed by this and he feels injured and the decisions he makes haunt him. And, and I'm sure lots of doctors feel that way. And, you know, just to read that in a book, I think helps, you know, not just a not just someone who's facing cancer, but just someone who is facing any illness. I just thought that it was good to to hear a little bit, like like someone else said, the personal side of him. Just I think it is very, very hard on people who take care of people who have cancer and they want answers and they know patients want answers. And just hearing that personal side, I thought was interesting as well. I thought he portrayed almost all the doctors, especially in the very early days of having to do all the experimenting with the different chemos and the combination of drugs. And for the, those of you who've gone through chemo know it's not easy. And the side effects are <coughs> awful. And they have to keep pushing and seeing the effects and having to have people stay in the hospital. They can't go home. I mean, he talked about, I only had chemo for 16 treatments, I thought that was forever. But in the book, he talks about how some people in the early days had chemo for months and months or years of chemo. And yet the doctor, you have to prescribe that, you have to push it, you have to document it, knowing that almost the chemo is harder than the disease. Um, and, and I thought that came across for almost all the doctors, how horrible that was, but yet they knew they had to do it. I just and, want, and lots of times it didn't work. <laughs> you know? right. mm -hmm. yeah. I just want to add one thing. We're going to mute all of the, uh, the people online, uh, and then you can unmute when you want to speak because it's creating some feedback. So hopefully that works a little bit better. Bottom left corner, Bottom left corner to Bottom unmute. Microphone. So you'll see a, a microphone icon, bottom left corner on your computer. Just hit that when you want to speak. You know, it seems like it's a story of progress. You know, they keep making progress and uh, solving one more. You know, how do you use chemotherapy in a targeted way? And how much surgery? And how do you combine surgery with chemo or with radiation? But it felt like with Carla's story, at least the point that I'm at in the book, it's, it's a scary story. It's uh, not progress. I mean, it's the, her experience of chemo is dreadful. I mean, as you're saying, Beth. And so it moved in the opposite direction. It, it sort of tempered my optimism, but I thought that was uh, that was right. You know that um, that that an individual's experience might not be the experience of the biography of cancer. Another thing that stood out to me about the beginning of the diagnosis for Carla was how the doctor ignored her symptoms and didn't order any tests and that was 2004 and you know you know I just find it hard to believe that as recently as that that they didn't take do a simple blood test earlier when she had the symptoms that she had but but how patient has to be their own advocate yes. she demanded <laughs> tests yeah was good <laughs> I, I also noticed that as well that uh, the doctors at first didn't respond in a, in a very much as an advocate to the patient and, uh, and realized, of course, that besides having the research with all the answers, you have to have someone there who's doing the diagnoses and responding in the appropriate way. And uh, you have to have both or the patient goes untreated. Um, I think one of the things that I, I found really interesting and a little bit disturbing at the beginning of the book 
is the fact that while our bodies are evolving and the cells are changing constantly, cancer is doing it just a little bit better. It's, yes. it's evolving and it's becoming a whole new thing all the time. Therefore, doctors who are working to find a cure, or they're, they're constantly one step behind, or 10 steps behind, or however many, but that is genetically changing constantly is very disturbing. Yeah, I, he used that image of like these cells, they're the healthy cells and they're the cancer cells and they're intertwined and they feed off of the same thing and how to like, you know, nurture the one and kill off the other is the big challenge. But it, and it kind of made you aware of how important just overall attending to one's health, you know, doing all you can to remain as healthy as you possibly can while undergoing treatment, how important that is. 100% agree. However, I mean, that, that also <laughs> then puts the burden on the cancer patient that, okay, so then if you've got cancer, you must not have taken care of yourself as, as well. And so you must have done something wrong. And, and that, I think, is, is something that people feel very strongly about when they get a cancer diagnosis, that, you know, that, that maybe they did something wrong when sometimes it's our environment, sometimes it's just a smart cell that, you know, it, and so while I agree that, um, you know, eating healthy and getting exercise and either drinking more or drinking less, depending on the research, <laughs> not smoking and checking for radon, those are all things you can do to reduce your risk of cancer to say to live the healthiest life you can and you, and you won't get cancer, then when, I, when I'm diagnosed with cancer, then that must have been my fault. Or sometimes people even say that. Well, what that did you person, do? Or that, you person took, that person took such good care right. of themselves. Right. How did they get cancer, right. you know? Right. And, or the other way. Right. <laughs> right. Or those, you know, it was a lung cancer. You know, they'll say, oh, was she a smoker? You know? And, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, maybe yes, maybe no. But, you know, it's just like we're looking for a reason that someone gets cancer versus the fact that, you know, pretty much we all know somebody with cancer. So there's a lot of reasons. So. And sometimes it just plain isn't a reason. Right. right. That's sometimes it just great. shows up. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you do everything right and it still doesn't work. My mom said, I treated my body as a temple and I feel like my temple's been raped and pillaged. <laughs> However, I do believe if you take really good care of yourself, if and when it happens, you got a good start to fight. Well, and during you know, treatment, you, know, you give yourself a best, your best shot. Your best shot. shot. Yes, yes because agreed. Yeah. I know I, I grew up in New Jersey and they called it the cancer belt. But it's right down the center of New Jersey where there was only industrial pharmaceutical plants and waste management, recycling, right down there in North Jersey. And so now I got the diagnosis of cancer while I was living in pure, beautiful Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking, what did it start then when I got inundated with all those toxins and my mother and father smoked like chimneys because everybody did back then? So I never smoked. Or was it when I hit menopause and then your body goes, woohoo, let's create cells that are smarter than the average cell. I mean, and that goes, to, did I eat too much bacon? Did I not <laughs> exercise enough? Did I, it, all that goes through your mind and I'm almost to the point where it, I guess it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter because how are you ever gonna figure it out? But I almost wanna know so that it doesn't come back. You know, I'll stay in Iowa, I'll never go to New Jersey again. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just these weird ways you think about it when you're trying to figure out how to avoid it by not blame yourself. Because I do, I you think about that. You know, did I drink too much? I think that society today, we're a sue happy society. You know, I hear about somebody pushing their kid in the grocery store and they walk away from the kid falls out of the cart, they sue the grocery store. And they win. We're always looking for a reason, somebody to blame. We're looking for something or someone to blame. And sometimes it's just not there. Anyone online? Thoughts?
I would just say that I'm repeatedly impressed with the bravery that I see in people who face this um, condition and just the uh, commitment to trying to help others. I think that that's impressive. So we've got 15-ish minutes left. Um, if you could maybe in one sentence or two, if you have to, go around and maybe say what you're looking forward to with coming up or what you're what struck you the most that maybe you're intrigued at for the next part, I guess. We'll start online. Why don't we start with, um, well, somebody's name is their phone, Alcatel 5044R. Maybe? Okay. How about uh, Jeff Crandall, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Well, uh, I read the book. Uh, a few years ago, so I know what's coming. <laughs> oh, that's a little unfair. Um, but, <clears throat> but it's, I guess all I can say is that when I read it, I thought it was one of the best books I had read. Uh, and I recommended it to many people uh, who, who came back and agreed. I think we're in for a, for those of you who haven't read it, it is going to be a treat. We will learn a great deal about the progress that's been made, particularly in the last 20 years, and it is astounding. Okay. Uh, Kristen, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I'm just, I'm looking forward to um, getting in and, and maybe it, reigniting uh myself a little bit uh you know i've been very very active uh with this group and with ignite uh in the past but i i really want to um, i hope dr crandall is is correct that um, i'm going to be really um energized by finishing off the book and uh you know so i can keep tackling and keep keep doing the work that we're all trying to do in understanding and uh, trying to stop cancer how about uh, Maylou Baxter? Are you there? Tell her she needs to unmute. You have to unmute your microphone, by the way. Bottom right or left, I can't remember. And not with my hand, with my mouse, right? <laughs> 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 um, my main feeling this evening is that you really need to read it. I hadn't re read even the assignment, let alone the book, and I felt at a disadvantage. So if I decide to participate again, I'll do the reading or I won't participate. <laughs> okay, how about Mark? Are you there, Mark? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Maybe type up your answer and we can read it out loud. Um, Mary Kay Madsen, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I think what I'm looking forward to is continuing to read the book and processing, um, processing the information that, it, that is there. Uh, as an FYI about me, I just finished radiation for um, breast cancer two weeks ago. All right, uh, Catherine Zeman? Yes, um, I, just, I think what I'm looking forward to most is the way that the reading makes me think about the, the causative factors and how that adds to you know, my understanding of um, the possible environmental exposures that contribute to to the issue. So, Mark, we're going to give you another try because we think we know how to unmute you. 
He doesn't have access. Okay. No, no mic at all. Okay, sorry, Mark. We'll, we'll, see. we'll hear from you next time. So what's your next? I was going to say, I read the book when it first came out, and I found, um, like we talked tonight, that it has the story that goes with the science that keeps you reading and pulls you through the book. Um, it gave a very good perspective of the history, and that, to me, what I was really looking forward to was the discussion and things that were important to others in the book, too, not just beyond my own perspective. I guess I'm always intrigued by the personal stories that people have gone through and um, just what, and I, I've been, I've been able to get some of the drugs that have come out recently, like the Receptin and now the Rituxan, which is new. And just to hear how that has come and that it's available now to help people that wasn't available before. So. For me, I, uh, having not gotten that far, just through that first section, um, at, it's, it kind of scares me how um, powerful and strong cancer cells are and determined they are to live and conquer our normal cells. Uh, so I'm hoping Dr. Crandall is right and will be inspired, you know, to feel more hopeful about the progress in the end because it looks like, look at how many thousands of years it's taken to get to where we're at today. And, you know, we have so much more, further to go yet. So I'm, I, I, I'm anxious to see how the story progresses. I think I'm looking forward to it. I was a little nervous when I saw the size of the book. Because <laughs> I'm not a, a voracious reader. But I find it very, very interesting and not that difficult of a read because it's so well written. Now, I will admit there are some words I have to look up because I don't know them all. But I have my phone with me and I do it right away. But I'm looking forward to learning more. I had. Uh, cancer in 1999. I had breast cancer and uh, I beat it and I just went on with my life until this last April when I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. And uh, now I really have the desire, I'm in a place in my life where I really want to know a lot more. So I'm really excited to, to find this book. So thank you for doing this. Uh, I'm excited to, to find out about like exactly the path that cancer research has taken and just how far along in understanding cancer we currently are. Um, I haven't read the book before, um, but I've read other cancer books, so I'm interested to see if some of them intertwine, um, specifically Henrietta Lacks and the whole informed consent movement and that sort of thing, and if that ends up kind of coming into play. I'm, I'm guessing it will just because Right now, they're, they're not worried about informed consent. <laughs> and so as it, as it gets longer on in, in the years, they, I know, obviously, that it got harder to get clinical trials going and it got harder to um, get, you know, patients had to know more before they signed off on surgery. So I'm interested in, in that perspective. Um, I guess I'm just interested to Kind of see where it's going to go from here as well. I was intrigued at how long cancer has really been around and had not really had any idea that any of this was ever going on. I really never read anything a lot about cancer. I'm a cancer survivor. Sometimes I don't really like to read a lot about it, but um, a book like this has made me a lot more interested in it. And I'm hoping to see the progress that we've made and that it can make more sense. And, and this book was written how long ago already? So even <laughs> since then, <laughs> how far have we come even since this book was written? So it's an interesting read. Um, I never even thought about cancer until I got diagnosed. It blindsided me. And um, I'm reading the book and I feel so ignorant. Because there's so much I don't know that I never even thought about. Like later on in the book, it talks about the American Cancer Society. We all know. What that is? Oh, I you don't know <laughs> the origins. How in? It, it's just very, very interesting. It's embarrassed me of how much I don't know, but makes me hungry to know. So that's why this is so good. Um, when I left work tonight, I called my husband and Sam's on my way, and he said, "Well, have have a great night." And I said, "You know, I could go home and just read this book, but I'm I want to hear what everyone else has to say about it, and and." I'm really interested in hearing from other people and 
and what they think of this and just having conversation. I think this, I've never been in a book club. I'm, this is exciting. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I read the book um, soon after it came out and, um, and I'm a breast cancer advocate. Um, I uh, represent the Beyond Pink team on the board of the National Breast Cancer Coalition. And so um, I'm, I'm interested, uh, one, to see the history of the advocacy. The, I don't think, I don't know if we've gotten to Mary Lasker and how starting the American Cancer Society and, and um, you know, getting money for cancer research. And the National Breast Cancer Coalition in the last few chapters has a, has a role in, um, in the development of Herceptin, which um, some women in this room are alive because of it. And so I'm looking forward to um, hearing more about the advocacy. Um, for me, this is exciting because it's like a puzzle. And it's from the perspective of cancer. So it's like the biography of cancer. So that was an interesting twist in itself. And the fact that it's a puzzle, but it's not a flat 2D puzzle, it's a 3D puzzle with moving parts. And that's what makes it so fascinating. It's like Harry Potter and the staircases that keep moving. Right? <laughs> so it's like, okay, which is the next staircase now? And, and that's what's fascinating. And I too, like um, some of you were saying, I'm reading this, but I'm also looking at newer videos of uh, books written by the same author to see where they are, you know, how that's being connected with what's in this book. So I'm excited. Uh, so I started in the middle because I'll be helping to go facilitate part four. And, uh, and so I kind of know what's coming too. That part is on prevention. and. Um, I was especially interested in that section because of our work in advocacy and, and trying to learn, you know, what we can do to help stop breast cancer, help, help end breast cancer. Um, but at the same time, I find the history very fascinating because it really kind of helps us um, understand where we are with prevention and where we are with advocacy and, and it gives us that base to build on and to hopefully attack it a little stronger down the road. I think this is a great way to wrap up because I, I want to be able to direct people to the Beyond Pink blog and also um, to the Ignite. If you just Google Ignite Cancer, you can find a couple of other, other resources if you're interested in advocacy and interested in uh, measures for prevention. And I think that is where the book goes next, um, political organizing and advocacy. So I think you'll find that very interesting. All right, so please give us feedback, especially if you found the, um, you know, the uh, technical aspects, the technology difficult. We want to know about that so we can fix it for the next time around. So please feel free to uh, give us feedback. You can do it right now on chat. And we're going to try to do something on the follow-up email. You can do that too. Right, and we're going to send a survey around too. So uh, you'll be able to give us feedback on that. And that goes for people in the room as well. <coughs> Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One thing I'll say about feedback, if you guys have this,